Okay, as the last section of Unit 6, we have um, Chapter uh, 16. Uh, chapter 16 is going to be a little bit of a hybrid. We'll have some calculation, some concept. Uh, the concept can get pretty tough in this chapter, too, because we're not used to uh, seeing things like this. Uh, we are used to hearing waves, but not really seeing them and analyzing them in this way. So be prepared for this. Okay. Now, if you are a musical person, then this could make a lot of sense to you, and it could help you in your music uh, and everything else like that. This is actually a tough subject and gets studied intensive, intensively. If you are like a music major, you'll have to take a science and music class or a physics and music class, which will cover all of these topics here. So let's start off um, with uh, waves again. And um, let's talk specifically the fact that waves can interact. Okay, And the reason that they can interact is because, unlike matter, waves can occupy the same space at the same time. This is something that you learn maybe in third grade, second grade, fourth grade, science class, that two things cannot be at the same place at the same time. Well, that's matter. Waves can, whether they're light waves, whether they're sound waves or anything else like that. So, for example, if this was pitching machines, these two balls right here, are they're each matter, right? So, when they try to occupy the same space, what happens? They collide and they move off of each other, like so. This is called, oh, sorry, uh, like this. Um, but if that same thing happened when it came to sound, you'd have a weird thing where, like, a you know, sound wave leaves, oh, sorry, go back, and sound wave leaves a speaker, and it sound wave leaves the speaker and it comes and hits here and another one left here at the same time and then they bounce off of each other so like you know essentially that would happen here and it would happen here so basically Alan can only hear this speaker and Bill can only hear this speaker but that is not true uh, by evident of what I hear in my class all day long I can hear anybody anywhere in the classroom that sound does not bounce off of each other like a you know, baseball would um, they just continue on their path. And right here, those two sound waves occupy the exact same space. This is called the superposition principle. They are can both be in the same position, and they can overlap with each other. So we got to think about how they overlap, and basically, while they're overlapping, what is this interaction? Okay. As they occupy the same space, uh, the particles that are in the medium are under, under the influence of both simultaneously. What does that mean? Well, right now, this piece of particle of the rope and this piece of particle in the rope, this one is in the influence of wave one. This is under the influence of wave two. All right. As the wave moves, no longer in the influence, no longer in the influence, that's okay. But this one right here who had no influence before, right here, is now, uh, because these two are overlapping, is under the influence of both of them. All right, Both of them together, and it has to obey both of them together. They each have rules about how they're coming in, at what speed, uh, actually the speed rules are the same, but at what jam amplitude, uh, how long is the wave, all that kind of stuff like that. And it has to obey both those rules at the same time. And then once they're gone, they, um, uh, it goes back to the same. Notice wave one did not bounce and go backwards. Wave one continued on and wave two continued on. This is called interference. During this time, there is interference. We're going to have multiple types of interference. So the first type that we, we will talk about is called constructive interference. All right? How do you get constructive interference? Is when they cross and the result of the reactions is the sum of their displacement. Okay, that's actually just the, um, that's a generic thing. It's the sum of their displacements beforehand. So this displacement here is positive. This displacement here is positive. So you just add them up, okay? But if the displacements of each waves are positive, like we have here, then it's called constructive interference. They literally just add on top of each other. So as these over start to overlap, you can see this is the original square, and here this triangle right here is basically added on top of it. 
Now the instant between here and here, it actually looks pretty funky. It looks halfway, you know, it looked like, actually it would look like this. It looked like this. You'd have half that triangle, then you still have that same square, and then the other half of the triangle goes up like this. Oops, that was wrong there. The other half of the triangle goes up like this, right? And it looks kind of strange right there, but um, that would actually happen. And as they continue to pass through each other, you can see, oh, there's that odd shape right there, and then they go about their own business in their opposite way. Now, they have to have the same speed because, again, that is set by the medium and you cannot uh, have you know, two different mediums in the same rope. Uh, so that is constructive interference. That's constructive interference. They add together and they actually, the resultant wave, what we call this is the resultant wave right here. These are resultant waves. The result of things is the summation of the individual waves of both positive, so it actually, you know, resultant wave grows. That's the key thing, constructive interference, the resultant waves grow, okay? If it's not constructive, then it is destructive interference. If one is positive and the other one is negative, then they overlap and they begin to destroy destructive interference. They begin to partially cancel out. And they can also have some odd effects because you have this one, which is still here, which is my positive, And you still have this one, which is my negative. And they're overlapping to make that kind of overall shape right there. And actually, when they completely overlap, here's my negative, I'm sorry, negative, and then here's my positive. And they completely overlap, and they're the same geometry and the same amplitude. Guess what? They just cancel out completely. You would actually see a flat, you know, rope right there, or whatever that is, string. And then they would continue on past each other. And again, go about their business. And again, they have to have the same speed because of the medium. Okay. So the question is, what? So that was positive and positive. What if they are both negative? As in something like this. Coming in at a certain speed. You know, and also hitting something like this. Going this way at a certain speed. What would that be? Well, it's still constructive because the result would be when they overlap would be a bigger, right, a bigger change like that, a bigger triangle, however you want to think of it. You know, this is negative, that's negative, that's even more negative, okay? So it's still constructive, rather regardless if it's positive and positive or negative and negative. But the key thing is that if it is positive and negative at any point, then it is destructive, okay? So let's, uh, let's look at something kind of fun here, get a little simulation. And let's go to our simulation. This is waves on a string, All right? It's on the FET website. It's fun to play with if you ever want to. I'm gonna turn off any kind of uh, damping or loss of energy so we can see this a little bit better. Um, so uh, let's see, I'm gonna go to a no end. So there's no end. Uh, I'm gonna create a disturbance. I create a disturbance and it makes a wave, okay? So not a real clean one. But again, it does make a wave like this. All right. Now, let me turn on a pulse here. And I'm going to turn this, and every time I click this, it creates a nice clean wave. That's much better. I like that. Um, let's make a little bit higher amplitude. It's going to actually have a greater disturbance here. All right. I like that. And I could make the pulse width uh, a little bit less, make it a sharper wave, All right? Something else. Okay, I like that. Let's slow it down. So what happens? I create a disturbance and it moves through the medium. Uh, you can say, what kind of wave is this? Uh, well, let's say transverse transverse wave because the you know particles in the medium go up and down while the wave goes left and right. Um, okay. And let's see. Hold on here. Let's get back to this. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so as it goes, uh, sorry, uh, this goes right, this goes again up and down is what I was trying to get to the point where I could draw like this. Okay. As the wave goes right and left or right in this case. Now let's uh, clear that off. Now, um, let's talk a little more specifically. Um, and let's change something here. Let's change this to a fixed end it is no longer. Uh, loose end, 
as being the, uh, the window is now fixed. And so when I send a pulse down, what I notice is that pulse travels down the wave and it actually bounces back. Now there's a neat thing where it actually bounces back underneath. That's pretty neat. If I actually switch this to a loose end, you'd notice that it comes back ah, the same way. Okay. So let's play with this. This is going to bounce and it's going to come back backward, I mean upside, uh, right side up. But as soon as this guy leaves, I'm going to go play with this and I'm going to send a wave that is right side up. They're both right side up. Oh, constructive interference. They actually grew in size during that phase. Now they're both constructive here, both positive and negative. So they grow and have constructive interference when they overlap. Also constructive, but in this case, again, negative constructive interference. All right, see how that works? All right, so let's go to, um, let's restart this a little bit. And let's go, let me try to time it right. So this is going to go down, up, and it's going to come back upside down. So it's going to come back upside down. I got positive and a negative, right? And they are going to interfere. And because this is, uh, because this is a negative and this is a positive, when they overlap, you see that they actually destroy each other right here. And you get, you know, I paused a little bit off. You get complete destructive interference. But again, those waves are not destroyed. They are just passing through each other. This medium right here has to obey both of these rules. And so what you see is as you go by, by, now the positive one is here and the negative one is here. Again, they're going about their own business. Okay, So that's the general idea there. And we'll come back to this and do some special stuff with that. All right. And the key, well, actually, I'll, let's go ahead and do that. Let's, let's, let's play with this and then do the special stuff. Okay. Uh, restart here. I'm going to turn it on oscillate. Or actually, I'm going to do it on pulse. And I'm going to turn off the slow motion so I can have some fun here. And let's send some more pulses. Oh, I send tons of little pulses down here. And right now I have, you know, if I were to look at this, I have like, you know, four or five different waves traveling back and forth. But you no longer see those waves, all right? You see just a mess. Now, if I were to turn on this, oscillate, and let's, let's make this oscillate, and if I were to get my system just right, and let's see if I can do this. Uh, will it do it or not? No, I gotta change my tension here, and let's see if I can get that to work just right. And what I want to create is something called, let's, let's crank this amplitude down, let's simmer down. What I want to create is something called a standing wave. All right, so a standing wave is a wave that, um, okay, I got this all messed up here. All right, is that, um, what happens is that the interference, oh, there we go, oh, almost. Uh, the interference happens right here, and it ends up creating something called a standing wave where you have a consistent spot of dead zone and consistent spot of a high zone. So, oh, there we go. Got a little bit, oh, we're a little bit off right there. We can see that these spots, these green spots, are not changing very much, but the red spots are changing quite quite a bit, okay? And that actually creates a something called a standing wave. Now, keep in mind, this thing is continuously going back and forth which means the waves are continually being generated, but you don't see the individual waves, you only see the result uh, of those, okay? And that is what is called a standing wave, all right? <laughs> okay, when waves of the medium, all right, when waves of the medium constructively and destructively interfere to produce a, uh, looks like, or it looks like, uh, now I would say that it probably looks like, um, you know, it looks like they you know no longer travel. Now the waves are you know act, actually traveling, um, but the but the result is that you just don't you just don't see that. So um, and again, if you can play around some string, we'll probably demonstrate in class, um, and you can see this uh, see this happen. 
Now, the waves are still moving back and forth, but they're in a way that um, that uh, they, cons they constructively and destructively interfere in a set pattern uh, that doesn't seem like it. Okay? And those create standing waves. So what you look like is something what it looks like is something like this. You have places where there are constant destructive interference, like here, is always destructive, just like that. It's on the flat, you know, flat right here. And you have other areas where they are constant constructive interference. And it's really right here. Because I, you know, we show all these different things right here. All right, that just means, you know, when we draw multiples like that, it just means it's a standing wave that goes back and forth right here. It's not a snapshot so much. Okay. Now, what do we know? Uh, first of all, we call these places right here where there's destructive interference, we call those nodes. You know, so those nodes right here. We call those places where there's constructive interference, anti-nodes. Nodes are places where things don't move. Anti-nodes, they go back and forth from some kind of positive amplitude to some kind of negative amplitude. Okay, back and forth. So um, the nodes are spaced exactly a half of a wavelength apart. Because if I start here, okay, and I go up, and then I go down, one complete cycle is one complete up and one complete down. And again, if that's one full wavelength here, if that's one full wavelength, then this has to be one half of a wavelength here. Uh, antinodes are these plus spots right here. Well, guess what? They're also spaced you know, one half of a wavelength too. Again, the same way to go from here to there, I have to do one full cycle. So this is a half of a cycle right there. So let's look at some examples here. I have a, um, a, a string attached to a wall and something's vibrating it here. And um, what I find out is that there's multiple modes and ways that you can create standing waves. And again, the demonstrations in class, the demonstrations that you can find online or YouTube, will very much, um, you'll be able to see this and solidify it. All right, so I can make one, which is your simple, what I call the jump roper, all right? So like jump rope, you know, it's just kind of going up and down, up and down, you know, things like this. Now, this is a node and this is a node, and then you have one anti-node right there, all right? So for that one, oh sorry, uh, one thing is we, we call this one right here where you get this, we call it a mode one, right? It's the first mode, and that's a mode number is what we say. So what, for this, what is this? This is a, well I start at equilibrium, I go all the way up, and then I come back to equilibrium, and then all the way down and up would be another cycle, but this is only a half of a cycle, so it is actually half a wavelength. So only a half of a wavelength, where you talk about the up or the down, fits into what I call this cavity or this area right here, right? So from here to here, some length, right? Only a half of a wavelength fits in there, right? Because this has to be a node and that has to be a node, right? So if that rule stands, that this has to be a node and this has to be a node, all right, then what's the next one? Well, I can't fit, um, you know, three quarters of wavelength. I can't fit, you know, five eighths of wavelength. I can only fit, you know, for this one, I can fit one complete wavelength. It has a full cycle up and a full cycle down. So I have for mode two, I can fit, this is one, uh, this is a half of a wavelength. For mode two, I can fit uh, one full wavelength. What about mode three? Well, still the same rule, this has to be a node, that has to be a node, so this goes into up and then down and then back to, oh, this is one wavelength right here. And then I have from here, I have another half. So what can fit in there? Nope, three halves wavelengths. Okay, one and a half wavelengths if you want to do it like that. So this, this, and this. So what pattern do we see? All right, well actually this is one over two, this is two over two, and this is three wavelengths over two. All right, so I have a pattern that goes. So what would four be? Well, four would be four wavelengths uh, over two, which would be two wavelengths, so on, so on. So I have an equation for this, okay? 
which is that the number of wavelengths that I can fit in a certain length, you know, space, I can only fit half wavelengths. So how many half wavelengths? Well, it depends on your mode number. Mode one, I got one, so that's a half wavelength. Mode two, this is two, which is one full wavelength. Mode three, this is three halves. Mode four, this is four halves, which is two. Mode five, five so on, so on, so on, so on, so on, right? And those modes can actually go on for quite a while. All right, so if I take this equation, this is my equation, uh, sorry, uh, let's go through that again. Uh, okay, I got this equation um, of the number of wavelengths I can fit in a certain length or cavity size or something like that. And um, so if I take this and I take this and transition to the next one, if I solve for wavelength, sorry, uh, there's a little bit of math magic there. You know, I started with, um, what I have there, I had M over 2 here, it's L, and I solve for this one, which makes this, you know, 2L over M is what I did here. Um, so this is a wavelength for a certain mode, is what I get here, and if I combine these two equations, uh, and I solve this for wavelength here, really what I'm doing is I'm doing V over F, and I plug that in, you know, here, and then I solve for frequency, then I get this. All right, so it's not as derivation, but this is really the, the main show right here that we will look at and talk about. Um, right. um, one thing to also note, um, I said this is mode one, this is mode two, this is mode three. What pattern do you see? Well, this is one, uh, Antinode, this one has two antinodes, this one has one, two, and three antinodes, right? So whatever, how many, if you just count antinodes, that's actually the same as the mode numbers. So that's gonna be a very convenient thing to answer things with concepts. Load this back up here. Okay. Um, so, yep, so here's the equation from before that we got. Um, what we call this first one, right, this first mode that can form, we call it a fundamental frequency, right? For Because for, for mode one, what happens? Well, frequency for one, mode one, is one times V over 2L, which I think is right here, yep. Um, and so, okay, what's the frequency for mode two? Frequency for mode two is two V over two L. All right, how are these related? Well, this one is twice as much because again, this mode number is just multiplying whatever. So these two, these, these are staying the same. So all that's happening is this mode right here. So, so on and so on. And if I notice that, then if I go through um, basically, all other standing wave frequencies are integer multiples of the fundamental. So if this fundamental frequency is 20 hertz, then this one must be 40 hertz. This one must be um, um, 60 hertz. This one must be um, 80 hertz, you know, so on, so on, uh, as you go. You just multiply by however many modes there are. These, these, um, this nature with multiple frequencies, you know, beyond the fundamental are called harmonics. This is the fundamental here, which we call F1, you know, and this is F2, F3. These are, you know, essentially harmonics here of the fundamental frequency. And again, in sound and in music, you um, make that connection a little bit better because you're somewhat used to this. Uh, here's an example here of all the different well, not all of them, but uh, like the yeah, first harmonic, which is this first one in a certain size, but then you have a one, two, three. So which one is that? That's actually the one, two, third harmonic, or actually I think it may be second, but anyway. Uh, and then here at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So mode number nine. And then even within that, I have another three in each one. So it goes on and on. It's kind of a neat uh, graphic there. So let's do an example here. This is actually the only example that I have for this section. Um, 
A 2.5 meter long string vibrates at a 100 hertz standing wave with nodes at 1 meter and 1.5 meters from one end of the string and at no points in between um, uh, these, these two nodes. So there's no more nodes in between, right? Uh, which harmonic is this? What is the string's fundamental frequency? And what is the speed of the traveling wave on the string? Okay, so first things first. Uh, two and a half meter long string so let's draw that. Um, make sure I'm in drawing mode here. I'm going to use my little guides here and see if I can get this correct. So I use this and I'll do um, one, two, three, four, five right here. So this is five, so that means um, you know each one is a, a half of a meter. Okay, so that makes this uh, 0 0.5. This is 1.0, this is 1.5, this is 2.0, decimals aren't showing up, and this is 2.5 here, and this is zero. All right, um, vibrates at 100 hertz, so I know my frequency is uh, 100. Now, I don't know what mode number this is yet, so I'll just keep it like this. Uh, we'll find this here in a little bit. Um, and it says that there are nodes at one, which is right here. That's a node, and at 1.5, so that's a node. All right. So if there's one at one and 1.5, and none of them in between, that means there's also one at two. There's also one at 0.5. So actually, the, the nodes are spaced out every um, half of a meter. Uh, I also know there has to be nodes at each. And we're vibrating a string like this. And so if I actually connect this and draw my standing wave now, this is what we see. And to make it a standing wave, we just kind of double up. You could triple or quadruple, make you know all kinds of lines. But the idea is that this is what we typically draw right here. And again, they should all be equal, but you get the idea. <clears throat> the question is, which harmonic is this? What is the string's fundamental frequency and so on? So what is the, uh, first of all, harmonic is saying what is the mode? What mode number is this? Well, the shortcut for mode number is number of anti-nodes, right? So by drawing this, I did some work for myself. I did one, two, three, four, and five anti-nodes. So I know that this is actually uh, not just some generic frequency, but I know specifically this is the frequency of the fifth harmonic because there are one, two, three, four, five anti-nodes. All right? So this is done. What is the string's fundamental frequency? So essentially, um, I, I guess I didn't introduce this equation, but the frequency of any particular mode is whatever mode number that is times the fundamental, oops, it shouldn't, shouldn't be an I, but the fundamental frequency, all right? So if I need to know the fundamental frequency, I just divide the frequency of whatever mode I'm in divided by the mode number. So in this case, this is 100, and my mode number is 5. So what is the fundamental? Fundamental, which is the first mode, is 20 hertz. So I know that this is here 5, and so that must be 20 hertz. What is the speed of the traveling waves on the string? Okay, let's go back to my equation to make sure I get it correctly. Uh, okay, fm equals m v over 2l. All right, I can go with that. That's going to be my equation to use. So fm equals m over, uh, let's see, equals V over 2L. All right, so what do I know? My fund, oh, sorry, my mode frequency here is 100. My mode number is five. V is unknown and two. And what do I know? I know the length is 2.5, okay? So 2 times 2.5 is 5, which cancels with this. So my wave speed is 100 meters per second. 
All right. So just with a little diagram here, what I read right here is a little bit complicated reading, but I could find the fund, uh, I could find the mode number, I could find the fundamental frequency and the wave speed uh, using this information. Question for you though, uh, when you strike a string guitar, you excite a bunch of wavelengths together. And actually you can look at this picture, I think it's pretty neat. Uh, but you have right here, you have these spots right here where the guitar string actually does not vibrate at all. This is our nodes right here. And you have other places where there's a huge vibration back and forth because of that standing wave that forms on the guitar string. All right. Um, so, okay, the question is, how does the musician control the frequencies that are produced by the string? So how do you tune a guitar? How do you control that? Well, first thing, you have, down at the end, you have the little knobs, right? You can control the tension. If you increase the tension in those knobs, you increase the tension, what happens? Well, my frequency sounds higher, right? My pitch sounds higher. And the question is, why is that? Well, the frequency, okay, I got mode number, sure, 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 all this kind of stuff. But if I increase my wave speed, then I, my frequency produces that are pre, frequencies that are produced actually increase too. So if I increase this, I increase this. How do I increase the wave speed? Well, if you remember back to the last chapter, I said, you know, through a string, you could say, oh, you had this right here, and this is mu, which is the linear density, whatever. So um, if I increase the tension in the string, then my wave speed increases. And if I increase the wave speed, my frequency increases. And that's why on a guitar that when you tune it higher or whatever, you twist it um, and it gets a higher pitch. Uh, the other thing I can do uh, if I want to increase this speed right here is I could actually lower this linear density, which is the um, you know mass per length. So I could actually do that. Uh, a lower linear density would actually be, I can't tell which one, but actually be a thinner string. If I pluck a thinner string, it'll actually increase the speed of the wave, which will also uh, increase the frequency in this case right here. Okay. So um, I got all those things uh, going. Oh, sorry. The other things I can actually touch here on the frets, right? And uh, and then I could shorten the length of the string's vibration, which again would actually increase the frequency. So that's all kind of neat stuff that you can do to uh, increase or decrease the frequency uh, playing guitar. So let's go from strings to wind instruments and to sound. Um, this gets a little bit complicated here because we are tracking pressure. We are tracking pressure in a tube. So what is a flute? A flute is a tube. Yes, it's got you know buttons on it also, but let's just think of it as a just a tube. The sound in an open tube travels like a pressure wave. That's what sound uh, does. They reflect at the boundaries and create a standing wave in the tube. So we have standing waves that are in the tube, but these standing waves are based off of pressure. You're gonna have areas in that tube which are going to have basic atmospheric pressure, whatever the outside of the tube is. And you're going to have areas in the tube that have high pressure and then, you know, uh, switch from high pressure to low pressure drastically like this. I think we have an animation on the next thing. Again, compressions are high pressure. Rarefactions are low pressure. So high pressure and low pressure. And you have right here where it's kind of equilibrium. This is your normal pressure. Now notice for the edges of the tube, this is a tube. This is my atmosphere out here. This is my environment. This is my regular pressure right here. This is my regular pressure. You stop uh, blowing into the tube or whatever, then essentially it's just all gonna equate down to this. There's no standing wave, there's no sound, anything else like that. So my edges for pressure must be uh, atmospheric pressure, just some kind of regular atmospheric pressure right here and I have higher pressure zones that move back and forth as we go. So look at this animation here, and I notice that uh, up here on top, I have some kind of vibration on this side. Um, you can imagine it as a, um, 
Oh gosh, you imagine it as a bunch of things, but let's just imagine it as something that's compressing it. It could be a read, it could be um, your voice, it could be something else like that. Uh, and actually in this case, um, so I got this on this side, and then actually on this side right here, um, this is maybe still open to the atmosphere, so the atmosphere is still out here. Oops, it's not working here. The atmosphere is still out on the left there. And all the way to the right, get my computer going here again. All the way to the right, I have a endpoint. Okay. And at this endpoint right here, right, I notice that there's also no change of pressure right there. Right. I'm sorry, there there is I'm sorry, there is a great change of pressure right there. So if I track a couple things, first I'm gonna look at pressure. That's density, okay? So right here I see it gets dense and then it gets stretched and dense and stretched. And if I go all the way down to this red line here, I see high density, low density, high density, low density, otherwise known as pressure. I have other spots. The density right here doesn't the density right here does not change. Okay, the density right here does not change. Right? This does not change. It does move back and forth, but it does not change. Here, back to high changes in pressure, and then back to low, you know, um, say areas where this moves back and forth, where the density doesn't change, so on, so on, so on. And so you can actually see that happen. So here I have no change in pressure, because I'm at the edge. And then down right here I have uh, compression, whatever. So I have this standing wave that forms. Now, this is the way that the book presents the information as pressure. I'll go ahead and tell you that the AP exam and the AP use the displacement, the motion of the particles. When does it have the most motion? Well, this has the mo more motion than right here. Notice these aren't moving. So these aren't moving, so they call that a node. They call the areas that move a lot the anti-node, so on. Now, notice that these are the same, just flipped. Right? Same rules apply if you think about pressure, you think about displacement, the same thing happens at the end. So we're going to go forward with pressure and we should be okay. So it depends on for a wind instrument whether the ends are open or closed. Um, so you can have an open open, an example is a flute. Right? Your mouth does not cover the end of the flute, it leaves it open on both ends. So air is free to somewhat come and go from there. Open closed. You have a node, at, sorry, um, for open open, you have to have a node at each end. That means regular atmospheric pressure at each end. For open closed, one end must be closed. A clarinet, for example, you put your mouth over the end of the clarinet and you close off that, that end. There is a node at the open end because that is the... Um, Thing that experiences just regular atmospheric pressure and there is an anti-node at the closed end um, there. If both ends are closed and yes that is possible you will have an anti-node at each end. But the still still the same rules of the standing waves and the equations uh, apply okay with maybe some uh, changes. So let's look at open open first. Right? The ends of an open open tubes have nodes. Again, this is atmospheric pressure, regular atmospheric pressure. This is regular atmospheric pressure. Inside of here, you may have an area of high pressure. For mode one, you only have one area of high pressure uh, that cycles between high and low. But for mode two, you have two areas that cycle between high and low pressure. Three, you have three areas that cycle between high and low pressure. And again, the number of anti-nodes tells you how many modes there are. But what if you're closed, closed? Then this must be an antinode, and this must be an antinode, which means these are all antinodes, anti, you know, whatever. So for closed, closed, instead of counting the antinodes, you count the nodes, okay? For closed, closed, you count the nodes instead. Now keep in mind the equation that we had still holds the same. All right, if I look at this one right here, or really, um, let's, let me go back to my sketch um, sketch program because that somehow closed down. Um, and 
Let's see, go back to my sketch here. Uh, so the previous, uh, but even before this, uh, it was oh, my sketch tool. All right, so I said, okay. All right, well, this is closing down. Anyway, the uh, m over two times wavelength is equal to l. So I can I can still have a half a wavelength in here. So what do I have in here? Well, if I go from crest all the way to a trough, that's a half a wavelength. So this is still both of these hold a half of a wavelength. All right. What about here? Okay, I can fit two halves of wavelengths, and here I fit two halves of a wavelength, otherwise known as one wavelength, and this both is three halves wavelength. So the same rules apply, just that I'm counting nodes here, uh, anti-nodes here, and I'm counting nodes here. Now, the tricky one is when you get to open closed. One has to have an anti-node, sorry, one has to have a node, and the other one has to have an anti-node. So that always that must be true. Now what I notice is that if that is true, then the first mode is going from here to here, and that's the first way that can satisfy those conditions. Well, what is that? That is not a half of a wavelength. That is actually, because a full wavelength would go from here to here to trough and then back to here. That would actually be a quarter of a wavelength. All right? This is actually a quarter of a wavelength. Uh, okay, so here, if I go from here to here, that's a half a wavelength, and then I have another quarter of a wavelength, so this is actually a half plus a quarter, three quarter wavelength, so on, so on, so on. And so the fundamental frequency here for an open closed has a new equation that is not based off of half wavelengths, but quarter wavelengths. The first mode can fit one quarter wavelength in it. The second mode can fit three quarters wavelengths. It cannot fit two quarters because two quarters is one half and one half means a node to another node. Now what you see here, and I get that four uh, instead of two down here, but you also have the idea that I can only fit odd integers. Odd integers. One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, so on, so on. I cannot fit twos and uh, fours and sixes and so on so like that. So how do you, what's an easy way to find the mode number? Well you can count the anti-nodes and then double it. Alright, so you just got to remember these rules. Right? So uh, this one has zero anti-nodes, okay fine. This one has, um, well actually I'm sorry, what did I say? I said count it and double it? No, sorry. I think you, you count the anti-nodes and, um, well okay, so I Back up. The best thing probably is what they have drawn here. There's multiple ways, but the best one is, is you imagine it that it's out continuing, that uh, what you have is there and you double it. So like uh, essentially this is kind of like a half here and I double it to one. This is one and a half here. I double it to two here. This is one, two, two and a half here and I double it to five. All right. So that's, that's probably the best way. Um, so this kind of summarizes everything. We started off talking about uh, fixed ends. So this is fixed on each end, which requires nodes for strings. So this is a string like a guitar, things like that. You have to have fixed ends on each end. Um, and so we had, that was a nice introduction way to fi figure out this, and then eventually our mode frequency here. Now, this Right here, this condition applies for all three of these, whether it's open, open, close, close, or it's a string with fixed ends on the ends. Now, again, I can here, I just got to count the anti-nodes. It tells me my mode, and I can find everything else. Here, I have to count my anti-nodes. Okay, that's fine. But here, I just count my nodes. So I have one, and I have two. All right, and everything works out here. Now, this is all the same. An open closed tube changes that, where you have a node and an anti-node. And I can only fit quarter wavelengths, so it just changes to a four. And then specifically, I can only do uh, odd, um, uh, odd harmonics or odd uh, modes uh, in there. Okay, so this is very important to keep this one separate from the rest. And even this one right here, you have to know that you count the nodes instead of the anti-nodes. Last topic, 
for this uh, unit is um, something called beats. So if I have two, if I see here, I have two wavelengths, the red and the, uh, sorry, two sounds, two vibrations, two frequencies, uh, the red and the yellow, or orange, whatever it is. And you can see that their, you know, amplitudes are the same, but their frequencies are slightly different. The uh, orange has a slightly higher frequency than this one. And so they match up fine right here, but as they continue, they match up less and less until you actually look right here. Look at this. Right here, they actually are opposite. And this has a crest that has a trough. This one has a crest trough. And then eventually, they kind of get back into phase and then they're together. So as the sound travels this way and reaches the ear of the human right here, you see constructive interference. And then you see some odd patterns here of even destructive then back to constructive, right? And what we perceive this as um, is something called beats, right? So here they will constructively interfere. Here you'll have a whole bunch of destructive interference, and then in here you go back to constructive. Constructive will make the sound louder. Destructive will make the sound quieter, all right? So you have loud, soft, loud, soft, right? And what that does is create something called a beat, okay? So here, these two frequencies are slightly off. And what I have is a period right here, if I can track my mouse here, where this is a loud, you know, getting louder part right here. Then you have it quiet, and then you have loud, and then you have quiet. Now, keep in mind that there are frequencies going on in between, but the loudness to us kind of dominates, right? And so what you hear is this kind of wobble in and out. Boom, 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 boom. Okay? And it's based off of um, uh, one thing, which is the frequency difference between the two. All right? So the frequency difference all right, is essentially what this frequency is right here. Now, let's say this is 20 hertz right here on this top one, and this is 21 hertz. All right? What's the difference between them? One hertz. So what is the pattern of loudness that you hear right here? That this right here, this loudness occurs one hertz, like you know, one time per second. If these, if maybe this top one is 20 hertz and the bottom one is 22, then this beat pattern would actually happen, whatever the difference is, at every two times per second. So it would go instead of wom 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 wom, it would be wom 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 two times per second. All right. If the difference between these is three hertz, right, then it would be three times wom 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 wom, you know, so on so on, and um, and then that uh, beat pattern would um, increase. But it's all about the differences in frequencies. You need two similar intensities. Um, and similar intensities but slightly different frequencies to play at the same time and you will get a beat pattern as long as they're interfering with each other. Okay, that's the end of chapter 16 and the end of